Um, welcome everyone to this week autonomy talks. This week is a great pleasure to have with us Professor Takashi Tanaka, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Aerospace Engineering and, and Engineering Mechanics at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, something about Takashi. So he received his Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Tokyo and uh, his Master of Science and PhD then from uh, Urbana Champaign in Aerospace Engineering. Before joining Austin, UT Austin, he was a postdoc at MIT and at KTH. And his research interests uh, are in uh, control optimization games and information theory. And recently he has applied uh, his techniques to networked control systems, real-time data sharing and strategic perception. As you can see, he is the recipient of uh, many awards, uh, among which I say the NSF Career Award, but there are, there are many others. And today's talk uh, is going to be about minimum information, uh, Kalman Busey filtering. Uh, I, I read the abstract, and to be honest, I, I really look forward to it because it's something a bit new for me. And uh, I guess this, this applies also to the rest of the audience. So we're very excited to have you. Uh, go ahead, Takashi, the stage is yours. OK, thank you very much for your introduction. It's my uh, great honor to have this opportunity to present our I work um, in this autonomy talk series. And I just uh, found that uh, it's been six years since I last visited Zurich to give a seminar talk. And I still remember that I had some fun time there. And, uh, and uh, I also found uh, just by coincidence that I gave a very relevant talk six years ago in, uh, in, in Zurich. So that is actually showing my uh, long interest on the same a research topic, and hopefully we are making some progress over the last six years. Okay, so uh, um, today, essentially, I'm, talk I'm planning to talk about this, uh, our recent work on minimum information, common beauty filtering. And this is a joint work with my PhD student, Rishab, and our international collaborators in Australia and Sweden. And we have uh, posted a paper uh, on archive so if you're interested in taking a look at the de detail, um, uh, uh, you're welcome to do so. Okay. So uh, just a bit about our group at UT Austin. So over the last several years, we have worked on uh, several, several research questions that are lying at the interface between control and uh, information theory. And uh, one, one target domain that we are interested in is uh, this uh, network control system, where we are asking how to design control system over a resource constrained communication network. And uh, we, are, we have also other research projects that are more robotics oriented. And I was originally planning to talk about this uh, simultaneous perception and motion planning talk, but uh, when I saw uh, uh, the uh, speakers list, I saw a lot of motion planning talks. So uh, I decided to talk about something different. And uh, yeah, these projects are all different, but uh, they have some uh, shared spirits, uh, kind of common spirit in the sense that they are all trying to uh, blend control and information theory in some uh, interesting manner. So what I will present today is related to this network control system re research. And in particular, uh, we are interested in the problem of converting the continuous time signal into a bit stream in real time. And on the receiver side, the receiver is trying to reconstruct the original continuous time signal using those received information only. And everything has to be in real time. So that's the problem we are going to consider today. But before um, uh, introducing uh, the mathematical problem formulation, I, I'd like to show you a, a simple lab experiment that gives us a motivation to study uh, this kind of a uh, problem. So uh, I'm glad that Andrea is actually in this audience, but uh, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we became interested in this uh, 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 event camera. And, uh, uh, and partly because we are interested in high-speed vision-based control. And uh, event cameras are fundamentally different from the uh, standard um, uh, frame-based camera in the sense that it has a um, bio-inspired asynchronous pixel readout mechanism. 
And this figure essentially um, I took from this uh, very nice survey paper. This explains the working mechanism of each individual pixels. They are working independently. Fires only when it detects a light intensity change beyond a given threshold. I don't think there's a need to give a, a, a background to this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, Zurich audience. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, and because of this uh, read out mechanism, um, so there's no, no notion of frame rate in this uh, event camera. And instead, the output of this camera is typically organized in a so-called address event representation. XY is the pixel location, P polarity, indicating increase or decrease. T is a timestamp. And this timestamp typically has a temporal resolution of one microsecond. And because of this uh, uh, high temporal resolution, um, this device is considered to be good for high-speed application. And uh, it has a, um, also has a high dynamic range, meaning that you can look at the extreme bright things and dark things at the same time, again, because the absolute value of the light intensity does not mean a lot. And also in principle, this camera can achieve a low power consumption because it can stay silent uh, in principle when the scene is static. And uh, this camera is also good at highlighting moving portion of the image only. So this is the, uh, essentially um, my daughter and having some fun. And as you can see, this camera is, uh, is good at highlighting only the, motion, the moving portion of the scene only while kind of hide, hiding away the messy closet on the background. Okay. And uh, this is another video taken uh, by uh, this event camera while this uh, inverted, pe inverted pendulum machine is in, in operation. And as before, it's uh, uh, pretty good at emphasizing the moving portions only. And uh, as, as you just saw, it generates a tons of events when I, uh, when I wave hands in front of the camera and uh, doing something like this, okay? And uh, yeah, so it's a very interesting device, but uh, certainly it has some disadvantages. And in my opinion, one of the major problems is the large output data rate, which is also unpredictable. So what I'm showing here is the, uh, is the USB sniffer data showing the data traffic coming from the event camera when the pendulum video in the previous slide was recorded. And as I can see, there are small periodic, periodic event spikes, and these are corresponding to the peri periodic motion of the uh, in inverted pendulum. And also you saw a big event burst like this, and the first burst is essentially corresponding to the time when I waved my hand in front of the camera. So, uh, um, and uh, you also notice that the output data rate is in general quite high. I'm not sure if you can see this Y axis, but uh, here the stick is eight megabit per every 50, 50 millisec. So it is a, uh, on average, it's, uh, it's quite high data rate. So if you want to share this data over Wi-Fi or something, it is, uh, it is a challenge, okay? And uh, this table summarizes pros and cons of event cameras in comparison to uh, more conventional frame cameras. But of course, this comparison is not absolute in the sense that the situation is changing day by day as competing technologies such as CMOS are also advancing. But uh, it is natural to ask in what application domain the event cameras are better than other types of cameras. And in fact, there are several studies try to, trying to answer this question, but it turns out that uh, answering this question is uh, surprisingly difficult according to this paper, for example, because nowadays high-speed CMOS cameras are very cheap and good. And also uh, making a fair comparison between different types of devices, it's difficult because what do you mean by fair? Uh, is kind of different depending on the person. 
So what I thought was probably it's interesting to look at studying the difference between different types of sensors more theoretically. Well, at the end of the day, what this uh, uh, vision sensor does is to convert a uh, scene data, which is a continuous time high dimensional data into a bit stream. So it's a real time data compression problem. So can we say by studying this problem as a data, data compression problem, can we say anything about the structure of the optimal encoder? And if so, does it give any, does it give us any insight on uh, the, uh, uh, the, what the sensor hardware should be to achieve the, that optimality? So these questions essentially motivated um, uh, our study in this talk. And obviously I will not answer all these questions in this talk, but at least I'd like to formulate the, an information theoretic optimization problem that characterizes the optimal encoder in terms of the data quality it can achieve and the data rate it requires. Okay, so this is the, uh, the outline, outline for the rest of my talk. So I'd like to uh, jump on to the mathematical problem formulation next, and then talk about the interpretation of uh, information theoretic interpretation of the problem we formulated. And then we are going to talk about how to solve this problem and uh, by converting that problem as an optimal control problem and apply uh, uh, Pontryagin's minimum principle to solve this problem. Turns out that this is a very tutorial optimal control problem. This is good for uh, uh, education as an educational material. So if you're studying optimal control or teaching optimal control, this is this, the problem that I, I'm going to present is a very ideal material. And then finally, I will discuss an infinite horizon version of the same problem and uh, talk about some uh, convex optimization uh, formulation of the problem. Okay, so let me start, let me start with the problem formulation. So um, I think the easiest way to start uh, to introduce the problem is to start with uh, um, uh, the conventional column beauty filtering problem. Suppose that the signal to be encoded is given by this continuous time and a dimensional gauss markov process given by this equation, where W is a, is a white noise, a Brownian motion. And suppose that this signal X is observed through this Gaussian channel, and Y is something you can observe, and C is the matrix valued channel gain for this measurement. And we are interested in computing the MMSC based on the measurement Y. And we know that this can be done by applying the conventional kalman busey filtering problem. And here X is uh, uh, computed by solving this matrix uh, Riccati differential equation. So this is something we know already, okay? So this is a classical solution to the, um, the estimation problem. Okay, so now I'd like to change the problem formulation slightly so that this problem is, becomes more interesting. So in a conventional setting, the C matrix, right? So this C matrix is the uh, channel gain, this is given. What if I say that this C is something you can design also? That leads to kind of interesting optimization problem. So what's the purpose of, of, of designing, designing this C matrix? Well, there are essentially two purposes now. First, you want to choose C to sort of minimize the same thing. It's a uh, MMC. Uh, we want to uh, minimize the mean square deviation of X and X hat. So that's the first objective. But at the same time, there's a second objective we want to minimize the mutual information between X and X hat. And the mutual information is an information theoretic quantity that captures the statistical dependence between two random processes. So if X and X hat are statistically very dependent, this quantity becomes very large. So we want to avoid that, okay? So this is why I call this as a minimum information Kalman-Busey filtering. We try to attain 
the smallest possible MMSE while reducing the information consumption, okay? And uh, why this problem is interesting? Because this is a trade-off problem. In general, it is not possible to minimize these two quantities at the same time. So for example, think about increasing, increasing this C uh, sensor gain to plus infinity. So what's gonna happen as a consequence is that since you can observe X very accurately now, right? So the common Busey filter is able to reproduce the system, the signal very accurately. So you can achieve a very small MMSE. However, now that X and X hat are very similar statistically, the mutual information is very, very large. Okay, so that's not an optimal solution. The other extreme is that you can choose C to be zero. You're not observing anything. And in that case, what happens is that you can actually reduce this mutual information all the way to zero, okay? But then that's not good, obviously, for the purpose of achieving uh, the small MMC because you are not estimating anything, okay? So this trade-off, trying to minimize these two things is a non-trivial optimization problem. Okay, so in order to capture this trade-off, we are going to introduce a trade-off parameter alpha, which is a positive weight factor, and try to minimize the weighted sum of uh, these two terms, okay? And again, uh, the decision variable is this C matrix, which is a time varying uh, matrix. And in order to make this problem more interesting and meaningful some application, for some applications, we are also introducing the upper limit of this channel gain as well. Okay, so uh, I'd like to pause a little bit here, uh, just in case you have any question about uh, the, the problem we are going to discuss. I think Liang, your volume is pretty is pretty low. I, I cannot hear you very well. You can hear me now? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I'm just curious about the mutual, mutual information. So why are you not using the mutual information B to X and Z? So it seems that this is more meaningful since uh, in some substances this uh, represents the channel capacity. Uh, so yeah, I will give uh, the reason, a brief reason why this mutual information is operationally meaningful in the next slide. So okay, okay, sure. Yeah, Thanks. yeah, Thanks. yeah. So yeah, hopefully this problem formulation at least intuitively makes sense. And uh, as I promised, let me uh, explain why we are interested in this problem. And uh, this problem is related to data compression problem. So that's why we are particularly looking at uh, that particular uh, mutual information term. So uh, let me explain this uh, data compression problem in discrete time setting because it is, is it easier to explain in discrete time and there are more literature in discrete time as well. Okay, so that problem is the following. Suppose you are observing uh, this X, it's a, it is a discrete time random process. Here's an encoder trying to encode this X information into a binary message, MT, at every time step. And this has a length, LT, okay? And every time instance, the decoder try to reconstruct X based on the received data so far, okay? And we are interested in the fundamental trade-off between the data rate, the communication data rate required between the encoder and the decoder, and the end-to-end -end distortion or mean square error uh, achievable by this architecture, okay? So this expected value of L, so this is an expected quarter watt length of average quarter watt length of this communication, and this is considered to be a data rate, and this is a constraint, okay? And uh, this value is called the uh, operational rate distortion function. This is a function of D, so you can think of this as a data rate required to achieve the distortion D, 
Okay, so this is this is called a operational data uh, rate distortion function, and unfortunately, this quantity is very difficult to compute, as you can imagine, because you have to optimize a lot of things like a, op this continuous things and discrete things. So you have to think about approximating this function. Okay, and uh, then a popular approach to approximate this operational rate distortion function is to use the so-called information rate distortion function. So here, essentially, essentially, I replace this objective function, uh, you know, the expected code about length with mutual information. And also instead of uh, optimizing over the space of encoder and decoder, temporarily we are forgetting about the discrete nature of the channel and we are trying to optimize over this uh, uh, conditional probability distribution, which is commonly called the test channel. So now this becomes a continuous time, continuous optimization problem. So we can, there are, there's a higher chance that we can solve this optimization problem. Okay. And uh, I'm not going to explain the detail, but uh, then uh, there's some work trying to relate this information rate distortion function and the operational rate distortion function. Um, turns out that this uh, information rate distortion function is a tight lower bound of the operational rate distortion function. So by solving this minimum mutual information problem, we can predict the fundamental performance limitation of the communication architecture we explained in the previous slide. Okay. And uh, so this is the, essentially something we did that is meaningful in this concept concept and uh, so uh, essentially we are interested in solving this problem right and uh, so it's it is an infinite dimensional optimization problem because we have to optimize over the space of probability distributions but what we were able to show was that without loss of generality you can focus on this architecture so here the structure of this test channel is restricted to the one showing here comprised of static channel gain and the common filter, okay? You can always find a right channel gain together with a common filter that attains the optimal balance. And what was kind of surprising was that uh, this C matrix can be solved by convex optimization. And once we solve this, once we find this optimal C, we can in fact use that C matrix to actually construct a, a, a data encoder that comprised of a, 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 some uh, predictive quantization and entropy coding to achieve the desired data rate. Okay, so this is a bit uh, sort of a detail, but uh, there's a information theoretic interpretation of minimizing the aforementioned mutual information. And hopefully now that um, you can probably see that the problem we are going to study today is a continuous time version of the same problem. We are trying to minimize these uh, uh, two things uh, 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 by choosing the channel gain. Okay, so this is hopefully this explain why we are interested in this mutual information. Okay, and I will skip this slide in interest of time, but in information theory community as well, there is a, a re related studies. Okay, so let me talk about the solution. So remember that this is the problem we are interested in solving. Alpha is a given constant, C is the time varying matrix, that's a decision variable, okay? And gamma is the upper bound on the allowable channel gain, okay? So uh, it's a bit abstract at this moment. So let me think about how we can write this problem more explicitly, okay? And it turns out that this uh, first term in the objective function, which is a MMSE term, that can be written more explicitly as a function of xt. xt is the solution to the matrix Riccati equation. So you can something, you, this is something you can compute explicitly. 
And how about the second term in the objective function, the mutual information? So this mutual information, this is another very beautiful um, uh, theorem from 1970. This mutual information can also be written more explicitly as a function of C and X. And again, this X is the solution to this Riccati differential equation. And uh, yeah, so in our paper, we slightly generalized this uh, theorem by Duncan. So this uh, you know, mutual information between, we are interested in the mutual information between X and X and X hat. Um, but Duncan has already shown that how to, how to compute the mutual information between Z and Y uh, using this uh, Gilsanoff theorem. And all we did was essentially show, was show that the mutual information between Y and Z is the same, same thing as the mutual information between X and X hat. So this result actually allows us to rewrite our main problem in this form, okay? So this first term is once again, this is the uh, uh, MMSE, and the second term is the mutual information. And this constraint 1B is essentially the matrix Riccati equation. Okay, um, any questions so far? Yeah, please feel free to interrupt me if um, you have any uh, question. Okay, so yeah, so again, the decision variable is C, but here's an interesting observation. C is always appearing in this form, C transpose times C. So if we introduce a new decision variable U as C times C transpose times C, and consider this as a control input, you can actually look at this problem as an optimal control problem. And the optimal control looks like this. And again, X here is something you can see as a state, state of the problem. So you can think of this equation as a state space equation. X is a state, U is the control input. And the perhaps the only difference from the familiar optimal control problem formulation is that everything is now matrix valued, but that's the only difference, okay? So now uh, we have formulated our, uh, you know, sensor gain optimization problem, um, you know, channel gain optimization problem as an optimal control problem, okay? And uh, here's a, a, a couple of small remarks. Um, so from this, you know, correspondence between U and C, the solution to this problem, if we exist, is not unique because for each solution U to the second optimization problem, there's a non-unique way to factorize this matrix. So there are multiple uh, matrix C that satisfies uh, uh, this condition. So the optimal solution is not unique, okay? And another uh, small remark I want to make here is that uh, in this talk, I like to restrict ourselves to the square matrix C in order to avoid some additional technical uh, difficulties. If you're interested in, I can look at, uh, I can explain uh, these uh, comments more, but let me move forward, okay? So this is the uh, optimal control problem we are interested in. So the first thing we have to worry about whenever we have an optimal control problem is the existence of an optimal solution. Can we mathematically guarantee that the optimal solution exists to this problem? Fortunately, uh, in our case, in this problem, there's a very useful um, theorem called a Philippov's theorem that can be directly used to guarantee the existence of a measurable solution. So we don't have to worry about the existence of the optimal solution, it is guaranteed. And then what can we say about the optimal solution? And uh, if you have familiar, if you're familiar with optimal control, maybe you have seen something like uh, something called the Pontryagin's minimum principle. So we can certainly apply that principle to our optimality, optimal control problem to derive a necessary optimi optimality condition. Okay. 
So, um, so this is the direct consequence of the Pontryagin's principle. Suppose you found the optimal control U, then it must satisfy, and then there must exist a so-called a core state uh, dynamics PT that satisfies these two equations. And also in terms of X and P, the optimal solution U, optimal control U must be characterized in this way. So this is the, the implication of the Pontryagin's minimum principle. Okay, so this is just an application of the well-known result. Okay, so this is an, uh, there are several versions of the minimum principle, but we have to use a fixed endpoint, a fixed end time, free endpoint version of the, of the problem. Because if you remember the original uh, optimization problem, we are optimal control problem we are interested in solving. Um, uh, initial condition XT, X, X0 is given, but the, at the final time, the value of X is not constrained. So that's why I say we have to apply fixed end time free end point, end point version of the Pontryagin's principle, okay? So we are interested in solving this optimality condition, okay? But unfortunately, as I mentioned, this is a matrix differential equation. It is very difficult to analyze, okay? Because this is nonlinear. So, uh, we did some simplification. What about looking at the scalar case? Okay, so the state space is one dimensional, X is one dimensional, P is one dimensional. And in that case, uh, the canonical equation, P equation and X equations are written in this uh, differential equation. And the optimal control U is the minimizer of this quantity. But thanks to the fact that this is all scalar, we can actually, uh, solve this more explicitly. When the product of X and P are less than alpha, just by looking at the expression, choosing U to be zero is the solution. Otherwise, choosing U to be maximum, this is the solution. If this term is exactly zero, you can freely choose the value of U, okay? So this is the condition that we have to satisfy, okay? So, and here's a, so-called phase portrait. I'm trying to plot this vector field characterized by this canonical equation in a 2D plane of X and P. And again, depending on the region, right? So there's a switching surface over here, depending on this condition, uh, the, uh, the, the vector field looks different. In this region one, essentially the first condition of this applies, U is zero. So the canonical equation becomes like this. This is a nice linear system. Whereas in region three, it is optimal to choose U to be maximum. So substituting U is equal to gamma in this equation, we have this nonlinear equation, okay? So um, this is a linear equation, it's easy to solve. And I first see this, vector field, I almost gave up solving this equation because this is a nonlinear uh, differential equation. But then my student actually noticed that, hey, there's an analytical solution, this nonlinear PD or nonlinear ODE. So this is a called a uh, Riccati class of uh, uh, ODE. So it has a very uh, non-trivial um, uh, solution, okay? So if you, if you kind of visualize uh, this vector field, you get something like this. So the Situation is slightly different depending on the value of alpha. Again, this value, this alpha is a weight factor uh, we are introducing at the very beginning. If alpha is sufficiently um, um, large, there's a unique equilibrium point in this region one. Whereas if your alpha is very small, the equilibrium point is in region three. In some intermediate regime, uh, there's a very interesting situation in which the equilibrium point is existing on the boundary surface of this, uh, of, uh, this uh, um, uh, surface, okay? 
And uh, another observation we can quickly derive is that uh, this vector field is chattering free. So we don't have to worry about you know, uh, the non-classical solution to this hybrid systems. Okay, So we have a fairly good understanding of this vector field. Depending on the value of alpha, we, have, we know where the, you know, uh, these uh, equilibrium points are and so on. So we have a fairly good understanding of uh, 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 this vector field. And like I mentioned in the, this intermediate uh, case, this very interesting point in the switching surface becomes an equilibrium point, unique equilibrium point, if you pick this U to be like this particular value. Okay. So what's the value of understanding? What's the value of visualizing this uh, uh, vector field? Well, we are interested in this because this helps us solve the optimal control problem, okay? So remember that this is a um, boundary value problem. So according to the Spontoyagin's optimal, uh, 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 optimality principle, uh, the initial condition of X has to be X zero, whereas the terminal condition of P has to be zero, okay? So the initial condition in terms of X is fixed and the terminal condition in terms of P is fixed. So we have to satisfy these two boundary condition at the same time by finding the solution that solves uh, this uh, vector field. So this means X, you have to start with X zero. This means that you have to start somewhere on this yellow line, okay, initial point must be lying on this yellow line. Whereas by the deadline, you have to be ending up being on this, somewhere on this green line. So that's the problem we have to solve. So if you start with something over here, for example, I hope you can see the cursor. If you can see from, you, you, suppose if you start from here, you just follow this trajectory like this and quickly arrive at this, uh, green line. So it's maybe you arrive at this green line too soon. So that's not a solution. So if you start from, uh, um, let's say from this region, you are there and stuck at this, you know, um, uh, equilibrium point for a long time, and you won't be able to arrive at this green region by the deadline. So that's not a solution. So you have to find the right trajectory that satisfies those two, two bound two-point boundary value problem. And remember that this region one is corresponding to the situation in which U is zero, optimal control input is zero, and the region three is the place where the optimal control is maximum. So essentially, if you find a solution like this, then it means that initially you should choose U to be zero, and at some time step, you switch to U being gamma, and then coming back to U is zero. So that's, how, that's the interpretation of this uh, uh, phase portrait, okay? So there are several cases. We have, uh, we have classified all the possible cases that can happen. So case A, in which, you know, equilibrium point existing in the region one, uh, you, have, you can essentially have two possible situations. If you're starting from this yellow region, you never go, you never cross the switching surface. So the optimal control is always zero. And then remember U is channel gain, right? This means that you are not observing anything. So in terms of the original uh, channel gain design problem. So this result essentially means that you shouldn't be observing the process at all, okay? Whereas if you're starting from somewhere on this green, a blue region, you have to cross the switching surface once and then coming into this uh, uh, yellow region. So that means that initially your U must be maximum. And at some point you switch off to zero. So in terms of the original channel gain design problem, initially you should be observing the system at the maximum gain. And then after some point, you stop observing the system. That turns out to be the optimal solution. Okay, case B is more interesting um, um, because it's possible to actually, for example, if you're starting somewhere 
from uh, this uh, orange region, um, you can follow this orange region and stay on this clear point, point for some time and then depart this point after some arbitrary amount of time and uh, follow this uh, uh, green line to arrive at this xk, okay? So that solution corresponds to this solution. So initially zero, while you're staying in this equilibrium point, you, uh, you has to be take, taken at this uh, some interesting intermediate value and then coming back to zero and so on, okay? And again, we have uh, uh, these five different cases in this case. And case C, we can do a very similar uh, analysis. And again, the situation is kind of complicated because we have uh, four different regions, but uh, uh, we can fully characterize uh, the optimal solution, okay? Just to summarize, um, we have the following result. So for scalar problem, we have a pretty good understanding of the solution of this optimal control problem. Uh, so when alpha is in this um, intermediate range, then um, uh, 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 the optimal control can take at most three different values. Whereas other cases, the optimal control uh, can take either zero or maximum. So it is a band band control. And in all cases, the optimal control input is a piecewise constant signal with at most two switchings. So that's the solution we can, uh, uh, conclusion we can make for this uh, scalar system, okay? So, and then um, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, generalization to a higher dimensional problem because uh, we are interested in, you know, observe how to, you know, compress high dimensional uh, signal, let's say image signal, okay? X is a vector valued signal. So how we want to generalize that situation. But unfortunately, generalizing the solution we have explained so far, I have explained so far, is difficult because it is difficult to solve this uh, uh, Pontryagin's principle in high dimensional. So we make some uh, simplification uh, to do that. So one of the simplification we, we uh, assumption we make is that the channel gain uh, we are going to choose is now time invariant. So the problem is uh, to choose a matrix C that minimizes this quantity over the a very long time horizon. Okay, so that's the problem we are uh, focusing on now. And uh, we know that this uh, Riccati equation is converging to, a sum, uh, to, uh, to the solution to this uh, algebraic Riccati solution after a long time. So we can actually simplify this problem uh, uh, like this. So this is the optimization problem we, are, we need to solve at the end of the day. So uh, the decision variable here is a C matrix, it's a um, square matrix, and X, that is a, um, a positive definite symmetric matrix, okay? And they have to satisfy this Riccati equation. And objective function is to minimize the weighted sum of MMSE and the mutual information, okay? So it's a finite dimensional optimization problem, but unfortunately this is not convex yet. So we are trying to reformulate the problem uh, to be able to solve this problem. And we are not quite successful. So I would say this first. So um, we tried, we, we were successfully, we will be able to successfully convert this problem to a, something very close to complex optimization problem, but uh, it is not exactly convex. So um, if you are interested in um, solving this problem, um, I, I'm extremely happy. So please uh, uh, stay tuned. Um, okay, so the object, the reason why this is not a convex optimization problem is that both X and C are decision variables and apparently you have a product terms like this, okay? So, um, so let's take a look at this object function trace of CXC, okay? So uh, using the fact that X is a positive definite matrix, you can actually rewrite this objective function like this. And then 
it is a function of x inverse. So let's introduce y as a new variable, which is equal to x inverse. Okay, so this allows us to write the optimization problem in a previous slide in this way. Okay, and x and y must be related to this. And these two equations are essentially algebraic Riccati equations. Okay, and these two informations are equivalent under this condition. So these are redundant, but uh, we are intentionally repeating these two constraints twice to do something interesting in the next slide. So, um, okay. So uh, the next thing we are going to do is the variable elimination. So um, in order to convexify this problem, let me try to eliminate this variable C using the fact that this is upper bounded. Okay, so how do we do that? Knowing that C transpose C is a positive definite matrix, and it is also upper bounded by gamma C, we can actually uh, replace these three conditions like this. Okay, I eliminated entirely C terms and replaced uh, this equality constraint with an inequality constraint, okay? And uh, the eliminated variable can be reconstructed if you are interested in uh, by finding C satisfying this equation. Okay, so this allows us to kind of uh, rewrite our optimization problem like this. And uh, how about this term? You have Y quadratic term in Y. So can we linearize it? Uh, yeah. Uh, this is easy. This is just a simple application of the Shua complement. And one last thing, how do we deal with uh, this constraint? So this is the only source of non-convexity at this moment. Okay. Everything else is a linear function in X and Y. So these are all convex constraints. This, this red thing is the only thing that is not convex. So we can write this condition equivalently like this. And uh, the first inequality condition is fine, but then I have this rank constraint, okay? We have to find X and Y satisfying this rank constraint. And this is killing everything, okay? So this is the only source of uh, non-convexity. Okay, and unfortunately, this is the best we were able to derive it so far, right? But nevertheless, this is the result we can uh, present. So suppose that we find the optimal solution to this problem, although this is not convex, um, then we can construct the optimal channel gain by computing uh, C star satisfying this condition, okay? But one of the main message, the important message in this theorem is this blue text. So we know that this red, constraint, rank constraint is the only source of non-convexity, right? The rest of the problem is a convex optimization. So what happens if we just solve this convex optimization problem by forgetting this rank constraint temporarily to see if the solution happened to satisfy this rank constraint? So if that, soli that, if that happens, actually we, know that it is an optimal solution, right? Unfortunately, we are not able to prove that happens, but we can always do a numerical experiment. So what we did was that we generated a bunch of test data, A matrix and B matrix, um, try to solve this semi-definite program problem by excluding this rank constraint and see if the rank constraint is satisfied by the solution. And surprisingly, the solution is yes, in all numerical experiment we have, no matter how many uh, numerical experiments we, we did, the solution to this uh, uh, semi-definite programming problem obtained by forgetting about this rank constraint automatically satisfy this rank constraint. Okay, and this is essentially how the typical singular values of this 2n by 2n matrix um, uh, is uh, distributed. As you can see, there's a clear threshold at uh, this value of 15, right? 
and uh, and uh, just by post processing this data, we can get uh, you know a pretty intuitive solution uh, to the problem as well. Okay. So unfortunately, like I uh, keep mentioning, we are not able to prove this exactness. Um, but in a scalar case, once again, we know that uh, this is exact and this proof is super easy, it turns out. And the uh, solution to this problem is essentially, since this is scalar and it's, it's reasonably simple, we can actually solve this optimization problem by hand. And uh, again, we need some classification and, uh, and uh, uh, the optimal solution is obtained. And interestingly, those optimization, optimal solutions corresponding to the stationary points in the phase portrait that I derived in the previous section of this talk. Okay, so uh, let me summarize. So I formulated, uh, we formulated this uh, continuous time optimal channel gain control problem for minimum information common abuse filtering problem. And uh, we, uh, I talked about, um, uh, uh, the optimal time varying solution to finite horizon scalar processes. And also uh, we talked about uh, the optimal solution to an infinite time horizon problems for uh, vector processes. And there are future directions too. And, uh, um, and uh, yeah, the most important thing uh, that is, uh, our, uh, that is remaining as a future uh, work is that according theoretical interpretation of the problem studied so far. So we have a pretty good understanding of this uh, information theoretic optimization problem. Now, how do we use this understanding to design an optimal data encoder? Namely, um, remember we started off uh, from uh, uh, the uh, optimal vision sensor design. How can we use this um, a mathematical intuition to design uh, the sort of optimal vision sensors. So that's the a big uh, future um, uh, future research topic. And uh, with that, I yeah, finally I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, my fantastic graduate student Prashad and my uh, fantastic uh, international collaborators. And yeah, I'd like to uh, stop here. Thank you, Takashi, uh, for the great talk. Let's open the stage for questions. You can unmute yourself and ask or post it in the chat and I will read it for you. Uh, excuse me, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks for the talk, it's very interesting. Uh, um, I have one point, uh, maybe that's not clear to me. So in trying to transform the optimization problem to the convex optimization problem, uh, yes, maybe inside the 38 or something, and in, in, in the you know, the poorer slides maybe and uh -huh. yes in the cost um, actually the seeds in the original problem in the cost but after transformation the seeds missing from the cost yeah this type I'm not sure yeah in the first part the trace C X C transposer okay so this term so because X is a positive definite matrix you can suddenly do this right uh, yes, yes, yes. And here, essentially, what I did from uh, from here to here is uh, so we use the fact that it satisfies this Ricard equation. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. I missed a point. Yeah. Yeah. That's all my question. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for um, looking at uh, <laughs> that presentation carefully. Any other question? I have a question, Takashi. Um, I was trying to reconnect uh, what you showed us to the initial introduction with the event-based camera. And uh, so let, let me say, let me so first let, let me tell you what I understood. I think what you showed us that the, the optimal um, okay, well, there the are various cases, right? But the interesting case is the bang bang solution find the optimal sensor, uh, the solution, that solution in the, you know, in the linear case and everything. 
basically it's about I will uh, open my eyes for a bit and then I will close them again. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so uh, so the one question that I have is that okay that is, that seems to be it's a, it's a no, it, the optimal solution is open loop right because it doesn't really depend on what you're going to observe in those moments right so you, you can you you know the optimal strategy essentially before you see any data that is kind of okay okay you see, true, i see true. that you say yes so that's okay and, yeah and then and then i was trying to understand okay what's the relation with an event-based camera where you know it's it's okay for so it's a different process so you look at the derivative instead of the integral in some sense and uh, I don't know, like I struggle to, to reconnect to that. So yeah, that's really so, awesome. yeah, so that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's slightly, uh, so um, the reason why we can plan ahead when to um, open my eyes and close my eyes and so on is because I know the deadline of this problem. So that's the nature of this finite horizon optimal control problem. But uh, in, uh, the situation in which we are interested in optimizing a long horizon performance average, let's say, uh, you have to um, study something like this. And in this case, there's no such a switching phenomena occurring here. So the optimal solution is essentially C, which is a particular fixed sensor gain observed, uh, obtained as a consequence of this optimization problem. So. Uh, all I'm saying by uh, this result is essentially, um, it, so uh, as a sensor, it is optimal to use use this this gain C. And now there's a gap, of course, right? So I motivated this problem as a let's say an optimal vision sensor design problem. How that problem is related to this optimal solution? I you're absolutely right in the sense that. Uh, we are not really making that connection yet, but uh, 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 our intuition is that although you know the connection is not clear at this moment yet, but uh, our intuition is that this mathematical um, problem is certainly uh, related to um, uh, that original problem we started off. Okay, so but I'll just relate to even best control, where you, you know you know the setting of Astrom and uh, and friends were. So okay, so and this is not yeah the problem yeah. that you pose is different, but so but there like you want to I guess minimize the mutual information between the I guess the the state and the control in some sense, right? Because you yeah, so mm -hmm. yeah, so that's a that's a very good question. I sorry, I didn't include that result, but there are newer newer results of my students actually trying to uh, do that. So the approach we are currently taking is so we consider this event based camera as a discrete time process and take the limit in which this uh, um, sampling frequency is actually going to plus infinity, and in each this sampling frequency the encoder is allowed to send an information to the decoder. But this time, the class of alphabet that the encoder can use is doesn't have to be uh, so-called prefix-free, meaning that um, actually empty signal is, empty symbol is an, also a symbol, okay? So there's a, um, uh, uh, in information theory, coding theory, there's a class of code which is called a non-singular code. So non-singular code is essentially uh, uh, the class, the collection of code words, including an empty code word. And as you know well, an empty code word is very important uh, for event-based uh, control and estimation. So we're trying to use a, um, uh, some coding theory result that is relating the fundamental data compression uh, performance using this non-singular code expressed as a function of mutual information. So we're trying to exploit that cons this, this connection to derive a fundamental limitation of event-based data compression. Um, I'm not sure, I, I don't think I'm explaining this, uh, this well, but uh, um, we are, uh, I, I know 
I, I know what you mean, and we'll try to address the question. Okay, okay, this is a difficult question. Um, so actually, there, there's a lot of people who work on even by sensors that uh, also like to see a justification of the of the optimality. Like, okay, I guess the, the meaning in what for what control problems or at least perception problems is an even based sensor like the optimal in in any sense, you know, and yeah, and nobody yeah. can do this. So it's a, it's a, so I, I was thinking, so, and, and I know um, a bunch of work in, uh, I guess comes from sensor design or from, from computational photography, where, where they want to optimize over lenses and sensors at the same time. And basically they look at the, the sensors as, uh, you know, I mean, it's not that simple, but we can simplify to the, the set of linear functionals, right? Because the idea is that, you know, you can just average over time and space, right? So, and, uh, and now I noticed that here, so you, you, you say that C is basically the instantaneous linear function of the signal. Do you think uh, it would be much harder to say that C could be any functional? And, uh, and now that would also include you know, a derivative and uh, you see, and then you know, put like a kernel there instead of a matrix. Do you think it would, fundamentally change everything or, or not? Um, um, yeah, so I'm not sure if I understand the, the, the question correctly, but uh, yeah, so um, at this moment we are, our, um, we are optimizing over the entire space of C, but uh, um, of course there's a hardware design aspect of the problem when it comes to sensor design and uh, there's an easy, C metrics to realize in hardware, and there are difficult C metrics mm -hmm. to realize in hardware, and uh, we are not taking into account that aspect yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, yeah, so um, we are, yeah um, we are also kind of a bit struggling trying to. Uh, so this is a mathematical, as a mathematical problem formulation, this is fine, but uh, as an engineering uh, problem formulation, this is a bit uh, strange. So I was trying to, uh, we, we are trying to fill the gap between uh, these two things right now. Mm -hmm. So if you have any suggestions or like a, a direction to go, I'm happy to kind of discuss further. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think it's it's very so. I mean, what you do is very hard. I mean, you choose for yourself a topic which is very hard, and uh, where the the you know even I understand you know even even slight variations of these problems, you know maybe the formalization is completely different, and uh, and you know it, and you have to assume uh, you know linearity at least for the dynamics. So otherwise, you know, there's really little that you can do, and there's a big gap between that. And yeah, the, of course, of course, sensor. Mm -hmm. So, so it's it's obvious. That, so it's like it's obvious at least that you can take the linear. I mean, I wouldn't even call it linear, but you know, there's a linear base there, and then you can use it as a as a you know, if I know the linear result, then I can kind of guess what the linear result is. But then the the, the algorithm does not translate immediately. That's right. And, That's uh, right. Yeah. And, and, so, so even yeah, looking so at short problem. yeah, yeah, even looking at the mean square era. I, I don't think this is optimal in practice. We should be, that's not reflect any uh, image quality in any sense. So, uh, but this is, this is again, sort of a starting point of the problem formulation. Mm -hmm. All right, okay, just a last question. So I, I understand that you are in the, in the moment where it's very frustrating because uh, since the problem is uh, Okay, so it seems like for all the empirically, it seems like the problem is convex because all the solutions are actually are the ones of the of the convex problem. But what's your what's your sense? Is that is that is that is it is the problem convex or is the problem generically convex? It's just that you know almost everywhere is convex. And uh, what, what what's your guess? I honestly I. That's a hard question. I, my intuition is, 
maybe this is a redundant constant. I'm in, almost inclined to say that this is a redundant constant. We can forget about it. But if I yeah. say that, that's a, and, and if, if that's wrong, then that's a, that's a, yeah, that's a mistakes. So yeah. I don't know, actually. My student is actually looking at it uh, for more than six months by now, trying to understand what's, what's happening to the solution. So, uh, uh, but uh, if you're interested in play, please uh, uh, try. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, again, uh, this uh, paper is available on archive and uh, we are discussing this problem a bit in detail. So uh, yeah, uh, if you're interested in resolving this issue. Uh, I, no, yeah. I'm not probably not the person, but uh... <laughs> I just, I, I mean, I just know the feeling that, you know, you're close, but, you know, not there yet. And in mathematics, like, that's not really close. Either you, have, either you know it or you don't know it. That's not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Uh, Takashi, I have also a more question. Uh, related to maybe what Andrea asked in, in the first of his questions, which is I was trying to make sense of the kind of applications. So yeah. assuming you assuming this you get over this uh, this struggle period with the constraints. So what is the the basic case study in which you can test uh, test these ideas? So because you mentioned you did a numerical study generating random matrices, but <laughs> Uh, what about a, like a realistic uh, case study for for a real, for a problem in I don't know in robotics or yeah so um so this problem is essentially um I started off as a uh, uh, the way I introduced this talk was starting off as a as a event event sensor but uh, uh, we are interested in actually uh, studying this problem as an as a uh, as a uh, network control uh, systems problem. So the interpretation is the following. Why are we interested in designing this optimal sensor again? Because, uh, so you can think of this as a, uh, let's say X is the high dimensional vision, let's say. And uh, for some reason, I'm multiplying this vision by some uh, metrics and do something. And what, what's the physical meaning of this? Well, essentially, uh, what's the role of the C matrix is essentially um, when you are in encoding something using a lossy data compression, there's a, a sort of important subspace in data and less important subspace in data. And uh, in order to convert your data into a bit stream, you have to sort of introduce a fine quantization in the direction of important subspace, okay? And introduce a coarse uh, quantization in less important subspace. So what the, uh, the, uh, the coding theoretic interpretation of the C matrix is that essentially by multiplying this C matrix with some X with the C matrix, you're kind of introducing a coordinate transformation. You're rotating the signal in such a way that um, the important direction is actually appearing in the coordinate one, and then the second important data is actually appearing in the coordinate two, and so on, and then do the quantization. So this way, you can actually ignore the less relevant uh, uh, data uh, from, uh, from this encoding scheme. So I don't know. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so we have um, we haven't actually actually um, done a lot of vision-based research, but uh, for um, uh, control problems like uh, inverted pendulum, um, we have actually um, done this kind of uh, 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 encoder, encoder design strategy, and uh, yeah, it, yeah, it works well. Oh, okay, cool, cool. That's what I wanted to know. Very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Any any final question? Okay, doesn't seem so. Thank you very much, Takashi, for the great talk, and good luck for the next steps.
um, and thank you all for, for participating and see you all uh, next week for the next autonomy talk. Thank you.